Ali. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to LD4 day two. Thanks for being with us bright and early. Um, I'm going to go over a few links um, and then introduce our presenters. This session is an interactive IA-based approach to semantic applications for archival metadata. Um, this rec this uh, session is recorded and live streamed on the LD4 YouTube channel. You can see we have some helpful links here and a slide prepared by the co-chairs. Um, I'll also drop these in the chat. Um, this includes the code of conduct, the Twitter account, we're using the hashtag LD4 2022. There's a link to the Slack invite, um, the Slack channel here. If you need tech support at any point during the content, uh, conference, you can uh, find the tech support channel on Slack. And there's a link to the LD4 2022 YouTube videos at the very bottom there. Um, friendly reminder that you can ask questions in the chat or use the Q&A section of Zoom. And um, we'll try to get your questions answered as we go along. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers and then we can go ahead and get started. Uh, Jason Kama is a professor of English and research chair in literature and sound studies at Concordia University in Montreal. His recent critical works include Phonopoetics, The Making of Early Literary Recordings, and the co-edited collections, Unpacking the Personal Library, The Public and Private Life of Books, Collection Thinking Within and Without Libraries, Archives and Museums, and Cam Lit Across Media, Unarchiving the Literary Event. He is also the author of five poetry collections, most recently FLARF. Jason is principal investigator and director of the SSHRC funded Spoken Web Research Partnership that focuses on the history of literary sound recordings and the digital preservation and presentation of collections of literary audio. Tomas Nogbauer is the digital projects and systems development librarian at Concordia University, where he participates in the design, development, and implementation of various research and library applications. His current research interests include information visualization, linked open data, metadata interoperability, open source software systems used for digital curation, preservation, and the building of digital, digital repository infrastructure. Francisco Beritzvieta is the developer at Concordia Library and the lead developer of Swallow. His interests lie in linked open data, text mining, and natural language understanding, currently collaborating with researchers from multiple institutions. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let you all take it from there. Thanks so much, Calliope. Uh, so my name is Jason Camelot. It's a real pleasure to be here. And my role is really just to set the scene for a project that, that Francisco has really um, developed and uh, taken the initiative on. Um, so as was mentioned, uh, I'm the director of the Spoken Web Research Network. And uh, the primary research question that inspires our work um, in sort of semi-automated uh, semantic annotation asks really how a literature scholar can most effectively engage with literary sound recordings for historical and critical research and teaching. So the artifacts in question, some of which you see here, uh, are sound recordings derived from an array of analog media formats, ranging from wax cylinder and flat disc, open reel and audio cassette tape, as well as uh, digital formats. Literary recordings in any media format are of interest to literature scholars due to the manner in which they document literary, literary works and activities in audible performance, speech, and um, just other things that, that writers do and that can be heard and then related to other literary materials. Once digitized, such recordings can be analyzed and annotated in ways that make them more discoverable and useful for critical engagement. So we call the audible signal that we work with as uh, derived and digitized from any previous media format, the audio text. The audio text is an interpretive concept by which sound is conceptualized as a signal with ideational, aesthetic, social, cultural, and formal qualities of historical significance. The identification of an audio textual signal with literature as an expressive art form entails explanation of 
how and why its sonic features can be understood to signify meaningfully in the context of the literary, quote unquote. So the generic features of an audio text become discernible in the located contextualized sound displayed in a recorded speech performance. And this is where semantic annotation comes in. The qualities that make an audio textual signal meaningful to literature scholars are to a large extent the semantic sounds that refer to known people, titles of literary works, organizations, events and places and other informative nouns that help situate the audio text within a network of possible literary interactions and contexts. So the Spoken Web Project has developed an extensive metadata schema for the annotation of audio texts, including a thorough contents field that offers time-stamped transcription and contextualizing information about the annotated audio text. In our description of audio textual content, even if we don't provide full transcription, we aim to include any noun, as I was just talking about, that is audible within the signal. These often consist of the names of other writers and references to books and individual works, such as poems, written by the speaker or other known writers. And by annotating this information from the audio textual signal with links to wiki and VF data, um, previously unnavigable audio texts become useful to literature scholars as sources of connection to a broad network of literary reference. So I'm gonna turn things over to Tomas to talk about the, uh, the metadata a little bit more. Uh, good morning. My name is Tomasz Neugebauer, and uh, I was uh, involved in uh, the design of the metadata schema for this the description of these audio and video uh, materials. The schema in general includes, uh, you know, for librarians anyway, a very typical fields like uh, um, the title, the material description, the language, uh, some specialized fields like production context and genre. But also, you know, statement of responsibility, dates, locations, uh, rights, um, that this sort of thing, um, and the contents field is um, serves to describe the audio video uh, in more detail. The audio video signal it in, it includes uh, timestamps, speaker names, titles of works and books from which these works come from, uh, keywords in the heard content, uh, non speech sounds such as applause or laughter and potentially a full transcript of all that is heard on the recording. So by simple analogy, it can be understood as uh, equivalent to a table of contents of a book uh, using timestamps instead of page numbers. But it has the potential to be much more detailed than a typical uh, table of contents and to be linked to other data sources if the cataloger has the time and resources to make it so. And this is kind of why this uh, AI approach actually is this, this, this the timely um, addition of these, this linked, uh, linked data to the uh, contents field um, that is part of the context. Uh, so for the spoken web schema, um, the content field may exist on a continuum from containing kind of minimal data to a full transcript uh, and a detailed description of the sonic or visual signal with added Wikidata links where possible. So beyond providing basic information about the content of the recording, the primary purpose of this uh, descriptive uh, work is to make recording easier for a user to navigate according to points of information about the identity of the speakers and what has been said and actions that have occurred um, uh, or have been visibly registered in the recording. And the timestamping uh, points to information along the timeline of the audio video document um, so it can help to navigate. Um, so, uh, the, um, so this is an example in, on this slide, you have an example from our uh, instructions for how to create these timestamps, uh, an example of a timestamp from our schema. So you have first the, uh, the first element identifies the agent behind the timestamp sound, in this case, uh, Margaret Atwood, um, which is you have a numerical timestamp, a descriptive label, which uh, comes from a controlled vocabulary kind of describing action, in this case, this introduces, but we have also performs, reads, signs, uh, sings, uh, resumes, asks, discusses, that sort of thing. And keywords, in this case, that's what we have. Keywords may be used to reflect the content in lieu of full transcript. Um, so these would be phrases that are heard inherent in the content. So they're actually in the audio. Uh, and if resources permit, and this is really important, we recommend that the catalogers include Wikidata 
uh, this is Jason Camelot's uh, uh, term, Wikidata Q codes, so essentially links to the <laughs> Wikidata entities um, in square brackets, uh, which actually is a full URL, so we can uh, more easily parse this. And, and there is a whole uh, kind of punctuation and grammar that we have in the, in the cataloging guide uh, that would then, that is designed to help us be able to parse this later and um, display it. Um, so that this, um, so the inclusion of, of the Wikidata Q codes would be for names of people, places, book titles, other keywords that may have Wikidata entries. And including such link data uh, in timestamp descriptions will make it more useful and discoverable. And it has the potential for data analysis and visualization. So there's such as co-authorships, uh, co-citation networks, subject maps, and so on. You know, I'll pass it on to Francisco to talk about how he, um, uh, his work here with trying to use uh, some automation tools, some AI uh, driven approach to this Wikidata uh, uh, enrichment. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you, Jason. I, uh, I would like, before we get into the, the details of, of the, the method and the experiment and what we did to, to come up with, with the tool, I just want to, to mention briefly that uh, what we're going to see, what we're going to demo today is part of a, of a bigger project that is called Swallow. And it's like, uh, and it's a metadata engine system that we designed specifically for the spoken web. And, uh, it's, uh, and it's essentially a, a sort of a bridge system that allows to uh, pull the, the uh, allows to to pull the the information structure from the metadata schema and generate the appropriate interfaces, and also allows to import from different um, different sources uh, or different systems. So it allows to aggregate all this data in, in an interactive way in a, in a central database that can then be exported to access systems and, and, and or, or for data preservation or Wikidata or different sorts. So it's this like sort of like a bridge system is kind of like the way we see it. The reason I mentioned this is because what we're gonna to see today is uh, this interactive, uh, we call it the interactive catalog and user interface is uh, what it does is like it generates all these forms uh, for uh, from the, um, the schema definition and also allows you to, for each field on, on the form, allows to create like uh, a, so a specific software that allows to interact with this field. So in this case, you can see the, the content field and it's just a form. In this case, it's a text area, but it has a little button and that button allows to open up uh, a widget that allows to then interact with this form so we can like enhance the interface and the user interface and this will become relevant in a minute. So, uh, so uh, like going back to the original question, the, uh, as Tomas mentioned, the way, the way it's, uh, is uh, done uh, so far was the catalogers need to go through these tests and do the annotations and then look for the different entities, uh, go on Wikidata, find the codes on the URLs and, and then input everything uh, sort of like manually on that field on the little form that you saw. And uh, that can be, of course, be time consuming. And you know, the first question is, well, can we automate this? And to what extent, right? So to do that, we uh, did an experiment because Lucky enough for us, we did have a, 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 a what we consider a, a big enough data set uh, that we consider that say, okay, let's take this already manually high quality annotated data set and say that's our gold standard and then um, come up with um, an automatic way and, and to then re-annotate the same entries and then compare both. So the automatic method is based on an API called DVP the Spotlight which is uh, I'm sure many here are aware are, are like know this project and it was developed by the Freie Universität in Berlin and La Universidad Politecnica de Madrid and they kindly put an API that is public and that we can all use so we sort of based our method in the speed light uh, as our entry and uh, we're gonna like talk a little bit in a like in a minute about the details of how this works so as for the data set, uh, we used uh, uh, what is it like 
the one that was already annotated is uh, were consisted of 54 unique entries in Swallow. And each of them have about 30. So we have like a little bit over like 1500 uh, different annotations, which we consider is you know, good enough to 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 run the experiment. Like, actually, it's informative enough to to see whether this has a, a future or not. And as for the uh, automatic uh, tagging on what we what we did, uh, basically, we start with a stripped down version of the of the um, the transcript, the contents field. So we took away all the all the links that were like manually uh, input there. So we have like a clean uh, a, a clean starting point. Then we run it th through DVP Spotlight and then we get a list of DVpedia resources. And because we want the Wikidata one, then we then dereference the DVpedia URI, get through the same as uh, um, property and then look for the Wikidata equivalent of that. So that's our method from text to, to Wikidata. And after running this for the whole data set, we then compare it by entry, you know, we calculate the true positive, the false positive, and then we can calculate the recall and the precision and we see we can see where we stand at. So we did a first pass with the default parameters and we got uh, uh, around, 40% precision and a almost 50% recall, which is, you know, not super great. You know, like we get like six out of 10 uh, entities are wrong. So, so we see, well, maybe we, there's nothing we can do to improve. And we added some filtering. In this case, the filtering is, we just wanted to exclude uh, a few things. Uh, so we try to focus on just persons, places, and written work, which is like pertinent to what we're trying to do. And we specifically exclude stuff like bad names and song titles, which you know, like there's a song name for every single thing you can think of. So it will, it will tend to appear or a bad name or a movie name that will appear. So that introduces a lot of noise. So by doing that, we increase the precision like drastically to 60%. Even though we get a little bit less recall, but I guess that's fine. Still, we're sixty percent. Still, like not awesome. So we by and this is interesting because when we start looking, okay, okay, what went wrong? Where were the mistake we wrong? In thinking maybe there is more we can do, more filtering we can do to improve. What we found is like a lot of the false positives weren't really like wrong, wrong. They just went like not relevant. The one was relevant by the <clears throat> by the catalogers. So. If we kind of relax a little bit the concepts of wrongness, it, it, it improved to around 80%. So we thought like, well, that, that's not terrible, you know, like 80% precision, you know, with a recall about 35%. So it's not great to do automatic. And it's something that Tomás pointed out like very early on. He said, like, and this is like, listen, we cannot like build a catalog, spend all this effort, and then have a bunch of like wrong stuff there. We want to be very careful. And we want to have like really high quality metadata. And that's what led us to the idea of doing, well, let's do something that is interactive. So if I cannot automate it fully, at least I can make your life easy. So, and this is kind of what we end up doing. So we developed this, uh, uh, this piece of software that you see the screenshot right now and that I'm gonna demo and hopefully it will work. So uh, the idea being that this will open from inside Swallow, like we saw, and then the, all the, the field will, will populate itself. So let's start with uh, uh, just going to grab uh, an example, sample data here. And you can see this is a, a part of a, a kind of like what Tomash showed, the annotations with the, the author name, the um, timestamp and, and you know the comments of what's happening at that moment. Okay. Uh, so let's just start by loading it. And uh, we can now you have uh, like like you say we can find try to find persons, places, or or like everything. And or you can do a straight up Wikidata lookup of any entity we saw. So we'll start to see to find persons, see what's happening. And this is live, so please be kind and patient. 
like what, what is doing this is now because it's, this is going, okay, here we go. So it found out three persons in this, uh, in this, in this text and it's called the poet, Basil Bonten, which is correct. Uh, Charles Baudelaire, which is also correct. That is right here. And the first vice can Montgomery of Alaman, which I don't know, Jason, but I, I don't know. And, and it relates to this uh, person is to a Montgomery, which I don't think it is correct. So this is kind of illustrate the, the because this is, a, this is actually a hard problem, right? To identify people and places and, and, and it's hard to do. So that's what, it, what you can see that it now it becomes evident the, the, the value of having a, an interactive thing where a person can do this like rather quickly and yet, uh, you know, like have high quality uh, uh, annotations. So if we just click this, this will then put the QR codes, you know, where they're supposed to be. So it will put this next to Baudelaire. They will put uh, this QR code next to basic bunting and this is uh, next to this person is Stuart Montgomery. So you can remove it and then, you know, it will fix itself. And for example, I didn't found John Wieners, the DVP the spotlight. But what we can do is uh, we can just check straight up on Wikidata. So we can come here, look up for it. And hopefully it will work. Okay. So, so we have it here and we can we'll add it. And then it will add it accordingly, like where it was supposed to be. And then the Places and written work do the same thing. We can see if we have any places here. Okay, so we look for places and it shows on others. So it found the Kingdom of England. And this is another thing that is interesting because it turns out that in Wikidata, there are like a million different ways to. to how uh, countries are tagged and the properties of countries. So what we end up doing is to to create a, we create a, a, a we build a Sparkle query and then pull out a list of what I thought was a comprehensive or as you can see right now and I did this on purpose you know like it, it is not comprehensive because of everything that is a country or there is like a place is what I try to do and and yet like I missed a few because you know this is tagged as a historic kingdom on the British Isle. So it's not a country, it's not a, a, a something else. So this is kind of like part of the challenges of, of doing this. Uh, and, and, and this is uh, pretty much what I want to show about this demo. So I hope, uh, uh, so I hope it's okay and I and, uh, hope you found value on this and I guess we're open for questions. If you have questions, feel free to send it through the chat or through the Q&A. Is it okay if I just add one piece of information? Just um, I think is interesting and relevant to what uh, Francisco just demonstrated. Is that all of this cataloging is, uh, that's being done is being done of collections that are held across Canada. So there are multiple partners who are cataloging sometimes very large thousands of items. And all of the catalogers are students. They're either undergraduate or graduate students who are working on implementing the cataloging of these materials. Um, so there's, you know, quite a lot of supervision, um, you know, to make sure there's uniformity across multiple universities that are cataloging collections and that are having students catalog them. But um, 
integrating uh, these facilitating tools contribute significantly to the uniformity of the metadata beyond also just all of the value that Tomas was pointing to of, of having these, uh, these Wikidata links as well. So just to set the scene for who's doing the cataloging and how this is being done, I think it's important to note that it's, it's primarily uh, undergraduate and graduate students at different universities across the country. Yeah, uh, uh, there is a question about um, <clears throat> uh, if we consider using an if to have like a, a, a more custom model. And uh, yes, and and actually, like funny enough, I was just looking at the results from uh, uh, the DVP spotlight because it's true; it is based, it is trained on on um, on. Uh, on the, I think it's the New York Times uh, uh, um, data set. So it's like news articles. But when you look at the result, this is the paper, by the way, the paper I'm showing now, the paper from DVP, the spotlight. And actually the support we get when we get uh, with the fault, when we include, when we relax the, the fault, the true positive um, uh, 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 definition, it's like on par, it's around this area. So it seems that we get like a similar uh, recall and precision in literary text than, than they did with, uh, <clears throat> with the news, uh, like using the, the general, uh, the general generally trained model. So we, to me, that was curious because I was expecting the same thing that we should do better if we have a, like a literary specific tool and this is something that we would like to to this is something that we would like to to uh, for certain this is something we like to look at because if we can like improve the the accuracy of this and like uh, narrow it down, it will be ideal. So yes, for sure we have considered using ANIF uh, as in the future. Maybe I can answer Christine Christine's question. Thanks for that question. Um, so we haven't done user studies yet on um, how the students have encountered this tool or, you know, uh, so the way it works is uh, at, a, at a university level, you know, there are smaller teams who are working on this cataloging. So there are supervisors, usually faculty members supervising that cataloging. But then I also hold weekly cross network cataloging meetings. Um, Tomas, uh, Francisco often pop up at those as well. And this is where student, student catalogers from across the network can bring questions. We usually set an agenda, you know, when people email things in and then we just uh, answer questions or talk about things. As of yet, use of the tool hasn't come up as an agenda item, um, but it's pretty new, newly integrated into our workflow. So I, I have a feeling in the coming year, um, there will be uh, questions about how to use it and, and, uh, and maybe questions, especially around whether we should select things like Kingdom of England, you know, or not, like if something pops up. So there are decisions like discretionary decisions still that arise by, by a cataloger uh, with the results of the, of, of the search. Thanks for that question. There is a, like the Wikidata response time wasn't too bad during the, your live demo. Do you say that everyday performance is comparable? Honestly, no. It varies a lot because we rely also on the Wikipedia first. So there are three parts. There is a, a Python Flask thing that runs in our local server that connects to DVpedia. And then we go to Wiki. We don't really go to Wikidata because we only go from DVpedia and then dereference and take from the same. So we don't really dereference the Wikidata link itself because, because we're interested only in the code. So we assume the correctness of the DVpedia entry. And still, we rely on, on DVpedia Spotlight API availability, which is you know, I'm sure they're doing their best, but it's not like a, you know, it has been down before. Like I'm very grateful it wasn't today, so I can <laughs> show you guys, <laughs> but no, it, it normally it's working. Like I said, like, I don't say like it breaks all the time, but it's, it's you know, yeah.
but when it works, it works like this, like like reasonable. It's like quite like I think it's like it's okay. I do have a few questions from the Q and A. Um, first question is: the code that's behind this could be valuable for many different purposes. Do you make it available? Do you see it as being general, like general to other metadata generation? Is there a direct route to Wikidata envisioned? The code, yeah, will be available very soon. Uh, it's not today. It's not today available because it's, it's still like um, I can I, mean, I can share it. We are going to open source it because both Swallow and this tool they are both. Uh, designed to be open source. There is a first version of Swallow in GitHub already, and we want this to put this in GitHub, and we will. It's just not there yet because it's a small thing that I need to, to deal with. That is like when the contest field gets too long, I need to, on the back end in our own API, I need to like split it in smaller chunks so we can, it can, it can, um, it will work. That's why the, the, the reason I do the demo with like a shorter piece of tech is like, first of all, like to make it faster. And then because it's too long, it will break. So there is a, a little bug that I need to fix. And that's why I haven't put the code yet in GitHub, but it will be in GitHub for sure. And uh, uh, under the, uh, yeah, the, the spoken web uh, handle, most likely. And anyways, if you like to see what we have right now, I'm super happy to share and like, just Shoot me an email. I'm like super happy to send you the code, like whatever. Like have a chat. Like yeah, they, that's that's what we yeah I'm gonna share it. Yeah. And we have a second question that says, "Do you know if anything similar exists for digitized archival manuscripts?" I do not. But I'm a developer, so I'm not the best at doing plural. Literature, <laughs> literature reviews. So. <laughs> no, I do not. I, I, I'm not sure if something exists uh, that's similar in the sense of what I really appreciate about this work is that there is that interface for the cataloger to interact with the uh, with the automated tool, which I think is um, is is like a, makes this approach. Uh, um, really interesting because uh, I, I certainly I know that other projects have done tests with automated uh, entity uh, detection, but um, it's that combination of having the interface there as well that I find really interesting. I see a comment here in the chat. Oh, it was Tomas. I'm sorry about. Um non-English languages. Um, yeah, the multilingual aspect is really interesting of this. Uh, it's the, this refers to the question of, with the use of AMIF, uh, which uh, looks at, uh, which I suppose is more uh, multilingual. I know that DBPDS Spotlight does have models um, trained in a few other, few other languages. We have not done any tests in any other language uh, in terms of the actual uh, content descriptions. And that's, Primarily because the all of pretty much all of the content that we have is is in English, uh, but yeah, I think it's something that we will need to look at, especially for 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 example for French. Um, One more question coming through the Q&A. As part of your workflow, are you identifying entities that do not currently have a presence on Wikidata? With the aim to eventually add entries for those items. I'll start this uh, the answering this question, but I think Tomas can probably continue it. We have had a lot of discussions um, about entities that don't yet appear on Wikidata, in part because a lot of what we're cataloging um, has, say, spoken word artists, things, people like that who may not have publications which would lead to their appearance in, um, in Wikidata. So there are a lot of important performers in many communities across the country who, um, yeah, just don't register, right? And so we've been communicating with and we collaborate with a, a couple of local um, community archives who do Wikathons, uh, which are sort of focused on really trying to get 
some of these names into Wikidata. So really work on, on doing this. And we've invited people from Wikidata to talk to us about how what the process is as well. Um, we haven't done it an enormous amount yet, but I think once we've done our a lot of our cataloging, we're in our third year of cataloging and we have you know many thousands of, en of entities now, of entries, I should say, items. Um, this is, uh, I think, a pass or a phase that we may want to do. Um, and Tomas led one of those wiki, Wikidata uh, jamborees. So maybe he wants to say something more about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you captured it well. We, yes, we definitely are interested in, and that would be one of the value added um, activities for the for this research project. Um, I think we would, uh, for that, we would more rely on identifying people, not necessarily in the contents field, but just in the statement of responsibility and the where we have uh, tried to carefully annotate um, uh, contr contributor names and their roles and it's, you know some additional information about them and with the aim of trying to export that to Wikidata uh, uh, in the future. And uh, ideally, again, in a semi-automated way, so far we've only really done it by organizing Wikidata kind of a wiki, what would you call it? wikidata Athon. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think it's such an interesting question because with any data set, I think you'll find the biases uh, inherent in, say, Wikidata, right, and what they do find recognized as important or not, right. In our case, it happens to be those with publications tend to be more obviously recognized than other forms of of artists who whose work maybe isn't as easily catalogable in in archives and libraries and things like that. I will say that it's a lot easier to add someone to Wikidata than to Wikipedia. Um, and uh, just because uh, Wikipedia sometimes can be quite contested. You know? Yeah, or, and, and the community archives that I mentioned are working on or advocating for both. Like, so they're really trying to figure out how to get, get people in Wikipedia as well. And thanks for that link, Christine. Uh, we'll follow it up and look at it. Uh, Yeah, I just want to add, like, I saw one of the questions it was about, like, if this could be generalized and used in a different context. And yes, the idea that both Swallow and this tool are not bound, like, not restricted to the spoken web metadata uh, schema. Like, one of the things that we insisted is, like, we wanted to, because we were going to develop this, we develop in a way that can be reused and so that's the whole idea of we're going to open source the software and it's going to be available for other uh, projects or for other, other institutions that want to that have similar issues. So yes, like both both the system and this are completely configurable. Like you, you can essentially define any schema and and it will generate all the interfaces, everything. So it will work, and then you can just add this as an add-on as a widget, and it will be able to to work with any any schema that you can define. You have zero restriction, but it's beyond what we want to talk today. But but yes, it is it is possible and it's designed to that it was like a goal for them and will make us very, very happy if someone else uses it also. Francisco, did you want to mention a few of the other uses that are current? Like that it has been adopted by other projects already. You know, so. oh, well, yes, it's uh, actually we use it in, in our library. We run uh, our uh, information screens with this. So that's where we put the metadata about the news and the events and that kind of stuff that runs the, the, the digital signage on the library. It also are also on the website. Uh, the, we are developing now some very small uh, learning experiences like learning capsules on, also on the library website that we're gonna use in Swallow is the backend to that in a sense, uh, and uh, also there was a research team from McGill from uh, the, the Faculty of Dentistry that they're using it to tag uh, uh, images for uh, training uh, 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 machine learning vision recognition to detect like different type of lesions in the mouth, like malignants and meningitis. So, you know, that, that sort of project. And this, like, like I said, this can be used for anything because you all up the picture and then you develop a little widget that allows you to like, you know, 
in the in the in the image tag where you need to tag and then it just so it's very flexible is what i'm saying like in, it's a little bit of like a kind of like a swiss knife so it's limited to what it can do but it can do a lot of stuff so yeah If there are any last questions, feel free to drop it in the chat or the Q&A. Looks like we have one coming in. Have you considered incorporating other sources for identity matching beyond Wikidata, like id.loc.gov? I'm thinking this would be especially useful for works such as text, et cetera. I don't know. Well, I haven't. I think it's a good suggestion. Like, what do you think, Tomas? Yeah, it's an excellent suggestion, uh, mm. uh, especially if the, if there is, uh, you know, it kind of depends on how easy it is to use the API. Uh, um, and the identification of works is something that uh, is more difficult. So um, it's a good suggestion. Maybe you could uh, drop a link in the chat to the the tool specifically that you mentioned. I'm not sure who it was that asked the question, but uh, if you could drop the link to the tool that, uh, or the API that. Uh... Thanks for that. Yeah, I should mention, we do use VF like for our uh, contributors uh, section. So like there are other databases that we refer to, uh, but for the contents, we've only done Wikidata so far. Okay, it looks like we're at time. I want to thank all of our presenters. Um, thank you, Christine. Thank you, all of the participants. Uh, please find us on Slack, YouTube, Twitter, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.